Welcome back to Your Finance TV. Now, the face you see next to me today is usually seen with us on a Friday, but today it's a Monday because Friday was Good Friday. Now, it doesn't make it a Good Friday because we didn't get to speak with Jay, that's for sure. But we thought it was very special to get Jay back for his musings because it is his monthly and some very deep, good insights that you should be listening to. Now, the title for this one is Look Behind the Curtain. Now, I know he's referring to The Wizard of Oz, which is one of my fav more favorite movies. Not my most favorite of all time, but it is a very good movie. Jay, run us through your thinking, though, of having the title of Look Behind the Curtain. Well, uh, Scott, great to see you and hope uh, Easter was good. And for all of those who celebrate Passover, Ramadan, Easter, it was an all-inclusive weekend, I guess, for everybody, right? Yeah, well, uh, so this was uh, Look Behind the Curtain. And uh, The Wizard of Oz, I know Oz is shorthand for Australia, so you probably know all about the kind of thing with witches and goblins and flying monkeys and stuff. I mean, I think that's called Tasmania uh, in, in general, is it not? <laughs> probably more like up north where we've got a lot more stuff that can kill you, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, okay. So enough of the joking aside. Um, look behind the curtain. It really struck me, Scott, as I was writing the monthly that uh, it was pretty apropos for the environment, right? We have this curtain, I would say, of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, the famous FUD. And it's really gotten investors very nervous. You look at sentiment indicators, you look at positioning, you know, all of that suggests that people are very much afraid. And it's kind of like what, what, what struck me was that scene in the movie, the original, the classic Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy and the Tin Man, everybody are towering in front of this huge, awesome voice and lights and everything. And then Toto, the dog, kind of pulls the curtain away. And you realize that there's no great and powerful Oz. It's simply a little old man, you know, pulling levers and stuff to try and create this but this fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, curtain. So our point at TPW is that when you pull that curtain back, that fear, uncertainty, and doubt, it's not a big, brown, bad Kodiak bear uh, that's that's waiting for you. It's actually a series of uh, very important tripolar world, so global uh, policy shifts that are unfolding and that we think are going to create the dynamic for a high nominal growth world uh, that is early cycle, not late cycle. So to, to kind of parse through that a little bit, uh, most people are thinking we're late cycle, that we're going to go into uh, recession. And so late cycle playbook is long duration, defensives and equity space, uh, things of that nature, as opposed to early cycle where you want to be in cyclicals, you want to be in stuff that's going to benefit. You don't want to be long duration. You want to be in things that are going to benefit growth, uh, from growth. And so the, the major policy shifts that we think are unfolding and that are being obscured by the FUD curtain are uh, first and foremost, central banks in the developed world accepting a higher inflation target than simply 2%. We've touched on it before, but we're really emphasizing it in the monthly. There's nothing sacred about 2%. The Fed only adopted it as a target a decade ago, literally a decade ago. There's nothing scientific behind it. We think uh, that central banks, the Fed and others are gonna validate this high nominal growth world by implicitly uh, moving off the 2% target. The second and very important, I think, is the return of industrial policy to the US something that we haven't seen in 70 years. And I think, as we'll touch on, I think this is a big differentiator between the current environment and what's happened in the past, right? A lot of signals suggest recession, but what's different this time is this return of industrial policy, which we see particularly around climate and uh, the tech space. And then leaving the US, but going around our tripolar world, Europe is integrating much more rapidly and deeply on the defense side, on the energy side, on the climate side. Japan, we think, is going to move off of yield curve control with the new Bank of Japan governor taking office uh, this month. 
first meeting uh, at the end of April. And then importantly, China's shift from fixed asset investing to uh, domestic demand-led growth. So those are all big, big policy changes that are not fully appreciated because of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt curtain. That's what people are focused on, bank failures, deposits, you know, as opposed to return of industrial policy. So we are of the we are of the view that we're early cycle, that the U.S. is not going to go into recession, that uh, interest rate cuts are not likely to happen as the market is pricing in in the U.S., and that the rest of the world is starting to accelerate, particularly uh, led by uh, China. And we think that's a pretty good world for risk assets, uh, particularly outside the U.S., as we continue to feel that a Fed on hold equals a weaker dollar, which supports non-U.S. Uh, equity uh, outperformance, which we've seen over the last year or so, but we think we're just in the early innings of that secular shift. Okay, so with your monthly piece, and for people who haven't watched this before, don't forget to click on subscribe below, but also don't... Uh, Jay breaks it down into five different segments, climate, economics, politics, policy, and markets. So what we're going to do now, we're going to break these all down in, in, into those segments. So we're going to start with climate, and COVID's obviously always one that's in there, and it's a key one. It, it seems to be like there was a lot of fear around COVID. Maybe that fear is not so much around anymore. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a, a really good point, Scott. And I would also say to potential new viewers that the monthly is – you know, a big lift for us. It's about this one was over 6,000 words, uh, 26 charts and tables from over 20 different uh, sources for us. And so you really get the best of not only our thinking at TPW, but a broad uh, group of research providers who we have access to. And we're cherry picking from their work over the course of the last month to provide the charts and tables that we put into the monthly. Um, and so I think that's an important point. There's a lot to dig into here. But with the climate side, again, I think you're spot on. We're making the case, Scott, that we're past COVID. We're now passing through the inflation story, which was a fallout from the COVID period, we believe, for the most part. Uh, and as we move past inflation and inflation fears, uh, climate is going to kind of resume its place as a really important uh, issue for uh, investors. And we see it really driving the unfolding of our tripolar world of regional integration in Europe, Asia, and the Americas, particularly through the regionalization of electric vehicle supply chains. And we go into that in some depth in this, in this piece, particularly uh, in the Americas. And then I think most importantly, the main takeaway from the climate uh, segment is that the public-private nature of the funding is going to protect the climate investment process from worries about credit and bank lending, et cetera. And that, again, is something that's different from the past. That's the re It's the return of industrial policy, the Inf Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act the CHIPS Act in the United States. All these are putting public money into the economy in a way that we haven't seen literally since the 50s. And that is protecting the economy against the downside risk that many people see. So that to us is a big buffer against the recession call that a lot of people are making and which we continue to disagree with. And so, Finishing on climate would say simply, it's the single biggest global macro theme out there. And it's been kind of obscured again because of COVID, because of inflation, now because of bank worries. But to us, it's one of the single biggest themes. We want to be invested in it. And we are in both our model portfolios, our global multi-asset as well. And in particular, our TPW20, which is thematic focused has about 40 percent of the model portfolio invested in climate now let's move on to economics then so uh, I, I can't stop seeing the word recession obviously you've touched on this already as well but 
everyone seems to be throwing the word out there. It's like uh, the Easter break. They're like, no one else had any different ideas. I just put articles out on recession, recession, recession. <laughs> well, it's that FUD factor that we've talked about, right? And I do think that today's media uh, does lead with the blood, right? Everybody's trying to get eyeballs. And, you know, we know from the tabloid era in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s that blood sells. And so everybody wants to talk about the recession. Nobody really wants to talk about, you know, the return of industrial policy to the U.S. Um, and so, you know, we, we talk and actually lay out a couple of uh, folks that we respect um, their cases for recession in this monthly and kind of go point by point where we disagree. I found it to be a useful exercise. Um, and in our view, basically, the fall off the cliff U.S. recession argument, right? We're gonna, we're imminent. It's coming in the next quarter, the next couple of months. Just doesn't compute for us. We we just don't see it, and it's hard to identify it. You just think about the jobs numbers last Friday, right? Pretty pretty decent, cooling, right? And so good on the inflation side, but still, you know, two hundred fifty thousand or whatever the number was, two hundred thirty five thousand jobs is a good number. Housing has bottomed. In 08, everybody wants to talk about 08. In 08, housing was uh, a disaster. In this case, today in 2023, housing has already bottomed. And we know that because we own XHB, which is the housing ETF, in our global multi-asset model. We've had it in for several months. It's actually doing quite well. So that's not recessionary. People want to talk about commercial real estate. Granted, I mean, I'm in New York, right? I'm in New York City. You know, it's obvious that uh, commercial real estate is struggling, but it's all people are talking about, you know, a trillion dollars that have to be refinanced in CRE by 2025. 2025, that's two and a half years from now. <laughs> you know, so it's, it, it, it's a scare tactics. Credit is solid. You know, you look at credit spreads, usually the, the, the tail that wags the, the dog of the equity market, particularly in recessionary times, there's no sign of recession in credit spreads. And I think manufacturing, a lot of people like to look at the ISM data there at 46 and say, oh, this is recessionary territory. Well, we think we're much closer to the bottom of that uh, decline in the ISM manufacturing. I would note, and we do note in the monthly, that it's already been declining for 25 months. The average length of decline is 17 months. And one of the things that ends the decline is a weak dollar, which supports exports and supports manufacturing. And lo and behold, what do we have? And we have a great chart in the monthly um, highlighting that, uh, that relationship and showing that the weak dollar, down about 6 or 7%, uh, should start to positively impact the new orders and new export orders in the ISM. So we don't really see it. Uh, we don't see an imminent recession in the U.S. And people keep pushing it out, pushing it out. It was supposed to be in the first half of the, US, uh, of the year. Now it's the middle of the year or late in the year or early in 2024. So, I mean, at some point, you know, when, while people are talking about it, you know, Investors who are positioned in risk assets, like equities, are actually doing quite well. And we'll get to that in the market section. So two other points on the economics is, what about the rest of the world? What's happening in Europe? Well, in Europe, uh, to give you an idea, uh, the composite PMI averaged 48.5 in the second half of 2022. And guess what? In Q1 of 2023, it's averaged 52. In other words, the economy is getting better. In March, the reading was 53.7. That certainly doesn't sound recessionary. And then you think about Asia and you look at China and China's March services PMI just came in at 57.8, the best in over two years. Japan's industrial production is running at 4% up month over month in the, in February. And finally, the Asian Development Bank just boosted developing Asia's 2023 growth forecast from 4.6 to 4.8%. So, you know, recession, certainly not outside the U.S., right? The rest of the world is starting to accelerate. 
Another reason why we were highlighting non-US equity opportunities, weak dollar, Asia and Europe accelerating their growth. And that's the, that's the global outlook that we bring to the table with TPW. We're not just looking at the US, we're looking at the whole world. Uh, and we think our tripolar world framework of regional integration in Europe, Asia, and the Americas gives us an edge on understanding how things are playing out versus other folks and firms who have more of a single uh, outlook on a single country or a single region. Let's move on to politics. Now, obviously, last week we had the whole storm, stormy in a teacup with Trump. Um, <laughs> But it's like, and listen, it's, it's sort of really died in the bum. I know it's sort of made a little bit of press coverage and so forth, but there wasn't really that much that came from that. Like Europe's more interesting to me on that front. Like there seems to be a lot more happening in Europe to me. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, I, I we we make the the note: uh, President Trump gets arraigned, and Manhattan barely blinks. Right? I mean, there was nothing. We're twenty blocks from. Uh, the, the courthouse uh, and, you know, it, it had no idea in our neighborhood that anything was happening. That's what the joy of New York, it's big enough to absorb the first ever presidential, uh, first ever indictment of a former president and nothing even seems to be happening 20 blocks away. Uh, but your point about Europe is well taken and where we really dig in is kind of the European parade of leaders or parade of European leaders to China over the last couple of months, right? Chancellor Schultz of Germany, uh, the Spanish president, uh, French uh, President Macron was just there over the weekend, together with the European Commission head, uh, Van, Van der Leyen. And so all of this, I think, is uh, Europe trying to get China to influence Russia to, uh, to cease and desist in Ukraine. And it will be very interesting to see if this happens. I think, and we think at TPW, that President Xi in China is playing very interesting game because it might be, he wants to have China in the US be seen on an equal footing. And clearly he's moving away from wolf warrior diplomacy, as we've talked about for the last several months, towards a more kind of China is peaceful and we wanna help and we wanna bring people together like Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I'm wondering if the the, uh, our, the the view of China is that President Xi can bring uh, President Putin to the table, it, strike a deal on Ukraine, the Europeans would like to have a deal on Ukraine, and China starts to look to the rest of the world as a peer of the United States in terms of global diplomacy. That would be a very big win uh, for China politically and for President Xi. And that's the thing that we're looking to see. And it really obviously would depend on if he's able to bring uh, President Putin, quote unquote, to the table. That remains to be seen. Let's move on to policy. Now, are we going to see another small little rate hike? Is it going to be one and done? Is it going to be none? Because we're already seeing signs everywhere else, like back in my homeland, which you referred to earlier. They're not... They're not doing any more hikes. Well, not for now. Um, but and also Canada, they're not doing any more hikes. Yeah, and I think that's the trend. And we've been talking about it again for months. We think we're at the end of the rate hiking cycle globally, and we're at the we're approaching the beginning of a rate cutting cycle. 2022 was a year of inflation and rate hikes. 2023 is a year of disinflation and rate cuts, particularly outside the US. As I said before. We don't expect the Fed to cut rates in the second half of this year. We also think the Fed is going on hold. So our vote uh, is uh, no rate hike in May. Uh, we'll see what the inflation data looks like, uh, I think, on Wednesday of this week, right? And then yep. I think there's another jobs report before the Fed meets again. Uh, and we think the conclusion is going to be they're going to go on hold um, and join, as you say, Canada and Australia. So it's not only the emerging countries that have gone on hold, that happened late last year. Now the developed economies are also starting to go on hold. And we think the Fed is going uh, to join them. And we think the Fed on hold will be the green light to signal to some of the emerging market central banks that they can start to cut rates. 
And so we don't, ex we continue to be of the middle path view. So no uh, recession. Uh, and as I said, no rate cuts uh, in the second half of the year for uh, the Fed. That middle path view, again, you know, one of the things we pride ourselves on at TPW is kind of really trying to focus on the future. And we've had the middle path view, as you know, uh, Scott, but some of your new viewers might not. But we've had that view of a middle path between high inflation and deep recession since uh, last summer. So it's going on nine months, almost a year. Uh, uh, and, and we haven't changed our view one iota. Uh, and so that continues to be the view in the U.S. As we touched on, we think Japan is going to move off yield curve control. That could be very bullish for domestic investor reallocation out of fixed income into equities, something we're watching carefully. And then China's policy mix continues to be very, very different from the U.S. China is providing liquidity. People's Bank of China cutting rates, the property market, which has been a big drag, finally starting to show signs of resuscitation. We note, and we have some great charts in the monthly, but we note that residential property sale proceeds were up 29% year on year in March, first after 15% gains year over year in February. So one of the key drags to the Chinese economy, a weak property sector, is starting to uh, accelerate. And so we, we expect China to grow around 6% this year and lead the rest of the world into a new global growth cycle. Well, that leads us nicely into markets. Now, listen, last week was probably a very small, flattish sort of week for the markets, but year to date, US markets have performed very well, especially NASDAQ. Now- Well, they have, uh, but uh, believe it or not, the rest of the world's performed even better. Uh, particularly the EFA markets and particularly Europe, which was up about 15% in the first uh, quarter, which is an amazing statistic. Uh, and then in the emerging markets, uh, Mexico, again, a market that we like a lot, uh, we're invested in in our global multi-asset model. We think it's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest winner of the reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring uh, trend that's taking place. Uh, Mexico's a big, big winner uh, in that. So yes, the US has done well back to back 7% quarters, um, which you'd never know from all the bearish talk, right? All these yeah. bears, I mean, we, we mentioned it the last couple of weeks. If I was, I'd be much more worried if I was a bear, right? We're not bears, we've been pretty constructive. We're fully invested. Uh, in our global multi-asset model and our thematic model. But if I was a bear and Q4 S&P was up 7%, Q1 S&P was up 7%, I'd be really worried. And yet you, all you hear about besides recession, as you talked about in the markets, all you hear about is cash, 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 right? Well, guess which was one of the worst performing assets uh, in Q1? Well, it's cash. Okay. It was up 1%. U.S. outperformed cash, emerging market equity outperformed cash, Barclays Ag fixed income outperformed cash, U.S. high yield outperformed cash, gold outperformed cash, virtually everything but oil outperformed cash in the first quarter. And yet that's all people want to hold. It makes, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it reminds us, and we use this quote in the monthly, you'll like this, Bernard Baruch, who was a famous uh, financier, uh, the main purpose of the stock market is to make fools of as many people as possible. Isn't that a great quote? Uh, and that is exactly what we think the market is doing uh, to all the folks who are buying into the bearish uh, uh, thesis and positioning in cash. Uh, cash is by the market, if you look back over the last uh, couple of quarters, the market would have to go down 10 or 15% before cash would outperform. Well, hopefully That's, we don't see that. Yeah, let's hope we don't. I don't think we will. And one of the reasons why, and we touch on it in some detail in the monthly, is uh, work of uh, Bank of America, which uh, has multiple indicators that they use to look at global earnings growth. And their indicators kind of come in and around flat to slightly up global earnings growth. 
but they point out that that growth sensitive risk assets are pricing in a 10% decline in global earnings over the course of this year. And, and they make the point, and we agree, that risk assets, particularly exposed to growth, have pretty much discounted um, the, a lot of the bad news about global earnings and economic growth. They, B of A says they've already been absorbed by financial markets, and, and we couldn't agree more. Uh, so one more data point, and then we'll finish up. The The data point I want to make sure people uh, that I reference is the long trading range that the S&P has been in right around 4,000, which is now going, according to Bloomberg, roughly 233 days. The, the S&P has been oscillating around 4,000. And, and Bloomberg notes that the typical extended trading range peaks at about 250 days, so less than a month away, right? And that the Fed tends to be the catalyst that breaks, the, that, that helps break the equity market out of that trading range. And so our bet is that it is going to be the Fed, the catalyst is going to be the Fed going on hold, and the equity market is going to break out and up as opposed to out and down, right? That's the recession call. We're pretty clear that we expect the Fed to go on hold. That will be the catalyst. Markets break out of this long trading range, up and out. Uh, and the opportunity is really in the cyclical, and this is completely against consensus. We have a chart uh, from a JP Morgan survey that shows, you know, what segments of the market are you invested in? JP Morgan asked their clients. 2% say cyclicals. 58% say defensives, right? So we think the opportunity is in exactly the stuff that's been sold since the banking stuff unfolded, which is all the cyclical stuff, right? The, the banking uh, kind of mini crisis uh, really was the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of recession pricing, right? Bonds immediately priced in recession, down 100 basis points or more. Equities, particularly cyclical type uh, equities, energy, financials, uh, things of that nature, industrials, um, have priced in uh, the good part of a recession. And so that's where we think the real opportunity is. You have the fear, uncertainty, and doubt curtain. We think it's going to be pulled back, not going to be a bear, but rather global growth, new cycle, and investors have been presented a real opportunity with the re pricing of recession uh, over the last month or so in much of the risk asset markets around the world. And Jay, for viewers, where can they go uh, sign up to see, see these musings? Yes, uh, Jay Pulaski, oh, sorry, Pulaski.com, uh, P-E-L-O-S-K-Y.com. Uh, and you'll find okay. the access to our musings which is every Friday and our monthly, once a month, uh, available there, as well as information on our uh, two model portfolios, 100% ETFs, both of them global multi-asset, our flagship, and then our TPW20 thematic model. Fantastic, Jay. Jake, once again, thank you so much for the monthly breakdown. I'm going to see you again on Friday and so can all the viewers. Two times in one week. It's like Christmas guy. has come early. <laughs> All right, Jay, you have a great week. We'll talk to you Friday. All right, Scott. Thank you. You too, buddy. And for everyone else out there, good luck investing.